So it's, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this book celebration of the, um, of the book called Intellectual Disability and the Death Penalty, written by Professor John Bloom and Dr. Mark Tasse. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator for this session, and I'm going to introduce the panelists in just a moment. But I'm going to, to say a few words about this book to start, because as someone who has been a death penalty lawyer now uh, for almost 30 years, I'm someone who I think of myself as knowing a little bit about intellectual disability and the death penalty. But I really enjoyed reading this book. Um, and I say but because in a way I thought, well, I know this stuff, you know? I mean, how much can I gain from reading what is designed to be, in a way, a primer on intellectual disability for the um, psychological community as well as the legal community, including lawyers and judges and even laypersons. What I was surprised by is how well the book distills uh, some of the most important lessons that both the legal community and the psychological community have learned over the years about intellectual di disability, about identifying persons who have intellectual disability, about the importance of competent psychological assessments by trained experts in the field, um, and most importantly, about the myths that continue to permeate uh, judicial consciousness about uh, persons with intellectual disability and the extent to which those myths and stereotypes continue to imbue uh, judicial decision making with respect to Atkins claims. Now, for those of you who have never studied capital punishment uh, and don't know the history of the uh, evolution of, of capital punishment in this country, the Atkins decision, Atkins, Atkins versus Virginia in 2002, was one of the seminal decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court finding that the execution of persons with what was then known as mental retardation violated the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. This book really is an outgrowth of the Atkins case in many ways. Um, and the panelists here all have some connection to um, the litigation of claims arising out of this Supreme Court decision. Some of the myths that still exist, even now, 16 years after the Atkins decision, include things like, uh, you can tell whether someone is intellectually disabled just by looking at them. Um, intellectually disabled persons can't read. They can't drive. They can't marry. They can't have relationships. Um, individuals or, or criminal uh, persons who commit criminal offenses, if they have some, even a minor degree of planning or effort at concealment of those crimes, they can't be intellectually dis disabled. Um, prison officers are perfectly appropriate um, evaluators of whether someone is intellectually disabled. These are all um, myths that have nevertheless continued to receive credence by many in uh, the legal community. And the book does a very effective job of debunking those myths and of showing how they continue to affect judicial decision making to the point where persons who have intellectual disability continue to be executed and continue to be sentenced to death in this country. Um, and, and the book also shows how differing um, assessments of intellectual disability or differing definitions or procedures that are being employed by different states have an enormous impact on the success or failure rate of Atkins claims so that now you have an enormous degree of arbitrariness in which Atkins claims prevail and which fail. Um, so I'm going to, to turn it over to um, the panelists, but before I introduce them, let me just say um, about John and Mark, um, Professor Bloom and Dr. Tasse, uh, that I'm convinced that they wrote this book because they were tired of lawyers like me calling them up and saying, hey, I got this case and I think somebody, my client might be intellectually disabled, can you talk to me about this? So really, I only need 20 minutes of your time. Um, you, you know, many of you in the room are familiar with Professor Bloom. Um, and you may be meeting Dr. Tasse for the first time, but, but both of these uh, men are leaders in our community. And when I say our community, I mean the capital defense community. 
Uh, they are people who are called on on a regular basis. I guarantee that they each receive calls uh, probably a half a dozen a week at minimum of people asking for their advice or consultation on various claims relating to intellectual disability. So again, that's my theory. I'm sticking to it. Uh, John can respond when it comes time for that. Um, so let me introduce our panelists. Eric Friedman, who's going to speak first, is the uh, Distinguished Professor of Constitutional Rights at the Morris A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra University. He is the reporter for the American Bar Association's Guidelines for the Appointment and Performance of Defense Counsel in Death Penalty Cases. He's the author of the authoritative monograph, Habeas Corpus, Rethinking the Great Writ of Liberty, and has written innumerable articles for scholarly publication on capital punishment and habeas corpus. Uh, for purposes of today's discussion, uh, it's worth noting that he received the Humanitarian Award of the American Association on Mental Retardation for his representation of Earl Washington, Jr., who was the first person ever released from death row in Virginia on the grounds of innocence. He later wrote up um, an article which was published in uh, the Hofstra Law Review in 2001 about his representation of Earl Washington and the story of his um, eventual um, release from death row. And, and there was a, an innocence claim in that case, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Um, the retarded guy confesses. The only problem is the DNA is inconsistent with it. It only takes only takes 17 years to get him. Yeah. Um, he has a new book that's going to be coming out this year called Making Habeas Work, A Legal History. Uh, the second panelist is Karen Salikin, who is a forensic clinical psych uh, psychologist who is also an associate professor at the Department of Psychology at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. She is someone who has been grappling with uh, Atkins cases since the time the Atkins decision was issued in 2002. She is somebody who not only engages in uh, uh, for clinical forensic practice where she works with lawyers to assess individuals who lawyers believe may suffer from or, or have intellectual disability, uh, but she also conducts research and has a small center at the University of Alabama Tuscaloosa that is dedicated to focusing on the forensic um, issues involving the forensic application of uh, intellectual disability assessments. Um, she is uh, involved in both trial level and post-conviction Atkins cases and also works um, in consultation with lawyers developing uh, mitigation evidence for capital sentencing proceedings. She was the um, site coordinator on the national standardization of the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale 5th edition uh, and through that was assisted in the development of norms, the assessment of concurrent validity, uh, and the assessment of uh, reliability for the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. And then finally, we have Sherry Johnson, um, whom all of you know, and I'm not going to uh, take too much time to introduce. Um, just to note that, uh, like John, she is one of the leaders in the capital defense community uh, and is somebody who recently has developed an expertise and a deep passion around the assessment of persons of Latino descent, in particular uh, Spanish-speaking individuals, who are grossly um, underdiagnosed as having intellectual disability. And so Sherry has embarked upon a project, um, one of whose ambitions is to draw attention to the disproportionate treatment of persons of uh, Latino descent who have intellectual disability. Um, I'm also going to introduce Mark Tasse, who uh, will be one of the authors who will be responding to the panelists' questions. Um, Dr. Tasse is a professor in the departments of psychology and psychiatry uh, and is also the director of the Nysinger Center. Sorry if I mispronounced that. A university center for excellence in developmental disabilities at The Ohio State University. He's also a licensed psychologist. Now Mark has uh, drafted countless articles on um, 
intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, and other related developmental disabilities. He's been the PI, uh, principal investigator, on more than a dozen grant-funded projects, uh, receiving funding from federal, state, and other sources. He has co-authored several published standardized tests, including those assessing adaptive behavior, which you're going to hear about, uh, and is the senior author of the Diagnostic Adaptive Behavior Scale, which was pub published in 2017 by the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. He was elected Fellow of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities and is also a Fellow in other associations that I'm not going to read out today. Uh, he is uh, one, of the, one of the leaders in this field and somebody that we all call upon for his expertise. Um, I should also mention that he is now offered to come with us to Sub-Saharan Africa to train Francophone lawyers in intellectual disability because he speaks fluent French, uh, being a national of Canada. So thank you all for coming, and I think I will turn it over to Eric Friedman to lead us off. Thank you. Um, uh, as many of you no doubt have, I'm going to ignore everything that Professor Bloom has uh, told me I should do on this occasion. Uh, he, he told me um, to spend lots of time on what a great book it is and then a few minutes on what you think it should have covered. Um, I'm going to do the opposite. Uh, I'm going to be relatively brief um, in saying what a great book it is. Um, it actually is. Uh, it's of real uh, practical value, not just because we get the clinical and the legal insight in one place, but also from a legal point of view, because we get the key empirical data on how courts have treated Atkins claims, pulled out of the law review articles and so forth into a form that will enable lawyers who are not law professors and who are not steeped in this stuff but actually have to litigate the cases um, to have guidance and can see things like the success rates on particular prongs of the diagnosis and even the bases on which those claims are most often rejected. So it's, you know, um, useful and sophisticated at the same time and um, very valuable. Uh, but the point I really want to um, highlight for the benefit of the conversation that's to come is what I think is the elephant in the room. And the authors do make it on the very first page, and it comes out very clearly in the discussion of jury behavior. but maybe for good reason, they don't give it a whole lot of attention. And the point is this. The basic Atkins rule of a categorical exclusion for intellectually disabled people from the death penalty, without consideration of the nexus between that disability and the facts of the crime, is to the left of where the center of the country is. I think that if you could accurately measure that center in terms of a conscientious decision maker, whether a judge or a juror, sitting on a capital case, it would be something like where the Supreme Court was after its Penry decision in 1989 and before Atkins in 2002, which is, of course, intellectual disability must be taken into account. That was the constitutional holding of the Penry case. And as a conscientious decision maker, all information about the characteristics of intellectual disability are important to me in doing my job, which is to determine whether this person deserves death for this crime. Um, but to tell me that the mere fact uh, that the person meets the diagnostic criteria for intellectual disability means he can't be sentenced to death regardless of whether that has anything to do with the crime facts is an insult to all of those hardworking people in the 
uh, kitchen at McDonald's who are intellectually disabled but entirely law-abiding. And in fact, at some points in the book, I was sort of wondering whether the authors might not be shooting at the wrong target on the intellectual level. They rightly make the big point, which um, Professor Babcock summarized, that the intellectually disabled can indeed hold jobs, graduate from high school, interestingly enough, uh, manage money, get a driver's license, and so on. Well, if intellectually disabled people can do all that, then exactly why do they get a blanket exclusion as opposed to the defense making the case that the death penalty shouldn't be imposed in this case because the facts of the murder reflected the defendant's inability to think of some better way of getting out of the situation or the interaction with the police or the co-defendants was shaped by suggestibility or by the uh, defendant's attempt to appear more competent than he really is, or the defendant would be at a disadvantage before a jury, or any one of a number of things. Um, because as an honest decision maker, if you show me any of those things, or even a risk of them, because you know, I understand nobody thinks a confession is false at the time it's made, otherwise they wouldn't be relying on it. So if you show me a, even a risk that any of those things had anything to do with this case, then of course I won't sentence the defendant to death. Because if you show me that, you show me the Atkins concerns are real and not something dreamed up by some platonic guardians in Washington. Um, and I think in all of that discussion that's to follow, we need to keep our eye on the big picture. Because to some extent, this is just an application of what Charlotte Holdman, the pioneer of mitigation work, uh, taught long ago, and uh, Professor Sean O'Brien and Dr. Kathy Whalen have written up more recently and more formally in the Hostel Law Review in 2013, which is diagnoses certainly have their place. But if, as a capital defense lawyer, your case degenerates into which diagnostic category does my defendant fall into, you've lost your case. Um, you need to present the whole picture, which is the main event. And the fact that the whole picture is consistent with some diagnosis is just a supporting reason for the life sentence, not the motivating reason for it. And of course, competent counsel will be approaching intellectual disability that same way, trying as much as possible to put a heavy emphasis on vivid storytelling about the client and less about the standards for meeting the uh, criteria for the diagnosis. But the difference here is this. What Charlotte Holdman and uh, more recent writers have been talking about is mitigation. But here, we're not talking about mitigation. We're talking about a legal preclusion of death if you meet the criteria. It's just like if you are a juvenile, you can't be sentenced to death no matter how evil you are. Um, as an, and uh, you, you know, the only legally relevant fact is your age. Um, well, okay, the only legally relevant fact here is do you have intellectual disability? But of course, the fact finding for intellectual disability is a lot more complicated than for age, which is why, as the authors say, when juries make the decision as to intellectual disability, there is reason to suspect that what they actually do is, quote, to decide whether the individual claiming to have intellectual disability deserves the death penalty, and then retrofit the intellectual disability determination in accordance with their sentencing outcome preference. And the reality is that that problem isn't limited to juries who are nowadays less often the fact finders about intellectual disability. It also extends to judges who perform the task most of the time. And ironically, the more the defense bar educates judges about how to avoid blatant non-clinical howlers uh, in finding the person not intellectually disabled, the more the fact finding is likely to be good and stick when adverse. And so the task of the defense bar is to make sure that the initial fact finding isn't adverse because um, it hasn't been put through this lens of a judge who 
its problem is that he doesn't see how any of the concerns of Atkins have any application to the facts of this case. And maybe the authors don't spend a lot of time on it because, like me, they don't have any really good solutions for that. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that um, to say to a judge, tough, the law is to the contrary, is not going to be very effective in this context as in any other. Uh, now, possibly a better approach is to emphasize what we don't know, which may make a prophylactic rule a little more palatable. Yes, it's true that as far as we can see, the confession matches the crime, and as far as the crime scene video shows, nothing on it reflects anything one can attribute to intellectual disability. But you know, Judge, that in any case, things may not be what they seem. And, of course, at some point in the law, even in capital cases, we take that risk. But what the Supreme Court has said has less to do with just deserts than with the acceptability of the risk, knowing as we do that intellectual disability is a condition. It pervades one's entire life, and no part of one's life is unaffected by it visibly or not. And so what the Supreme Court's categorical exclusion really like is like is a presumption, say, a presumption that a child born during a marriage is a child of the marriage. And of course, that may not be true, but there are lots of good reasons to have the presumption. And you judge, even if you are quite sure that in the case before you, the child is not the child of the couple, wouldn't ignore the legal rule because you understand those reasons. And that's what's happening here, Judge. The prophylactic legal rule is designed to present a mistake or incomplete knowledge regarding the facts, whether the crime facts or the mitigation facts or the just desert facts, no matter how sure we may be at the moment that we think we know them. And of course, that's not the whole answer to overcoming, I think, the judicial uh, unhappiness with the whole state of the law, but it may be helpful, perhaps, in chasing away the elephant that I think uh, needs to be acknowledged as being in the room. So good food for thought for questions. Um, but hold those till after everybody has spoken, and Karen will go next. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. All right. Well, I think I'm going to do a little bit of what you did. Start with what, what John asked me to do, which is say some good things about the book, and it is yeah. terrific. <laughs> We're all going to repeat it. We're all going to repeat it. Um, but it is. And I'm going to talk about a little of, of, from a clinical forensic psychologist's point of view, um, a little bit of areas where I have a concern, not an absence of information, but a bit of a concern. But I am going to start with something that is kind of interesting. I'm going to start with a statement from a 126-page judicial opinion in an Atkins case. It was a post-conviction case. And I just want you to listen to what is being said. The report submitted by respondent's expert, Dr. M, is most notable for what it does not contain. For example, Dr. M did not evaluate the petitioner's adaptive behavior before the age of 18, and he did not summarize interviews conducted with third-party informants for the purpose of obtaining some insight into petitioner's adaptive skills during the developmental period. Indeed, Dr. M didn't even identify the individuals to whom he spoke, and he devoted no attention to a discussion of the diagnostic criteria. Dr. M acknowledged the absence of this information, but asserted he did not include it in his reports, quote, as a matter of practice. He declared, in his opinion, it was important to state his conclusions regarding petitioner's pre-18 adaptive functioning only, quote, if that is what the bottom line turned on. That opinion is contradicted by APA's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which notes that when a, I'll forget that part, but which it notes, that it is possible to diagnose mental retardation in individuals with IQs between 70 and 75 who exhibit significant deficits in adaptive behavior. Conversely, mental retardation would not be diagnosed 
in an individual with an IQ lower than 70 if there are no significant deficits. Dr. Mc Dr. M sorry, attempted to defend the paucity of substantive information included in his abbreviated report by answering yes to the following leading question posed by respondents' counsel. That report, doesn't it include all of the work you did in order to make your evaluation of Mr. T? It's just a summary, isn't that correct? When asked by petitioner's counsel if this was custom and practice, to include all important conclusions and supporting information in your report, Dr. M answered, quote, I think it's important to explain what the conclusion is based on. And I guess you could have a debate about broad brush reports that may be three to six pages in length, seven pages long, or fine brush reports that may be 17 to 20 pages long. And most of my reports are in the three to six page range. I'll tell you how long reports typically are. Regardless of Dr. M's rationalization, this court finds that in his approach to forensic report writing leaves a great deal to be desired, especially in cases such as this one, where important societal and legal policies collide. Dr. M's report stands in stark contrast to blah, 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 and for such reasons, it is less persuasive. It goes on to say that even though Dr. M reviewed some of the historical records and did some of the same things as the other experts, he had to go through that report and find out, or through the report and find out exactly what he did. That is an example of probably the worst thing a forensic psychologist can read about themselves in a judicial opinion. But more importantly, in our cases, given the substantial societal importance with them, it's the last thing you want in an assessment period. Nobody, no matter what side you're on, wants your expert coming forward and having that said about them. These are things that are very manageable. Um, just good clinical practice, standards of practice would tell someone when you're involved in a forensic case in particular, but any case, you do the basics. And in this case, this evaluator did not. And not even identifying who they spoke with, when they spoke to them, where, time. Did you speak with them for 10 minutes, an hour? That matters. That provides the judge an understanding or a jury, which is much more rare, an understanding of how valuable is that information. But none of that was done. So the judge went on to decide that, looking at, at all of the information, that in fact there were weaknesses in the evaluation. And that's a point that's important for forensic psychologists to think about. Your report is a reflection of your evaluation. And here, it was sort of, at least in this judge's mind, a reflection. It says, Dr. McLaren simply ignored, ooh, I said his name, whoops. <laughs> Dr. M simply ignored the generally accepted practice of all competent professionals in the field of statistics, test theory, and psychology of being concerned with how measurement errors affect the interpretation of one's performance on a particular test. That is one statement of many, of a 126-page opinion. So clearly there was a very good, um, comprehensive judge, no matter what opinion was coming down, comprehensive, thorough, knew about the decision in Atkins, knew about concerns um, regarding how do you assess them, and in fact, left the courtroom with books, asked to see books, to read books on his own to learn more. And I can tell you, if you ever read that opinion, you will see numerous citations, numerous, uh, DSM, AIDD, um, I could go on, but this book would be one of them. So obviously this case predates this book, but I can promise you that would have been one of them in the cited list. And that tells you about the importance of it. It tells you that it's readable. It's understandable from all angles. It is a well-written book. It's concise yet comprehensive um, and reaches a broad audience, reaches experts and lawyers and judges. And I think that's super important. Um, we have to write at a, all of us have to write at a level where everybody who is involved needs to, to be able to understand. And moving on to, on that note, um, I think from a, from a perspective of someone trained in forensic psychology for, for years, um, I think it's really important that this book brings forward a understandable way of under, of understanding case law. We're, as forensic psychologists, we're sort of uh, geared that way. 
But most or many of the clinicians that are doing this work are not forensic psychologists, and you have to um, provide the opportunity to know that you need to understand Atkins at minimum, but no more. There's been recent case law, uh, Hall v. Florida and Moore v. Texas, which are ex extremely important. And this book mentions those cases. And while not going in depth and not being complicated, it provides this guidance to whoever's reading it to say, oh, I need to go there. I need to get that. I need to understand it. So that is fantastic. The other thing is, is that the clinical perspective. Now, clearly, I'm not a, a uh, lawyer or a judge. But from my perspective, that section or those sections are written very clearly um, at a level that is, is, is there to really clarify things, not confuse people. You know, again, there's guidance in there that, that says, okay, if you want to know more, this is where you go. But I'm not going to bog you down in this book with all of the, the subtleties, because that's really for a different book or further readings. So those things are, are, are just excellent, I think. Um, now, this is where I'm going to sort of move on into an area that I think is really important and it's been important to me because as a clinical forensic psychologist, um, we are not trained in the same way that, that ID specialists are. We're just not. We simply come through clinical programs and within those programs, we're trained. We're trained for um, identifying and assessing major mental illness. We are trained uh, for the most part. I, I can't speak to every program, but we're trained to identify intellectual disability as well and other developmental disorders. However, um, there has been talk for, I would say, going on maybe, maybe since the beginning, but certainly in the past mm, 10 to 12 years about who should be an expert in these cases. And I, can, I can't give you numbers, but I can tell you there's a fair amount of clinical forensic psychologists involved and a fair amount of people who specialize in ID. Those two being, in general, very separate. And that's brought up in the book, too, that it's hard to find a perfect expert and to know what that perfect expert looks like. So I, I, I give that. Now, from my perspective, I just want to read. I'm going to try not to read to you too much, but I am going to read to you one more time. And I'm going to read something that I think will kind of clarify what I'm, what I'm talking about. And this says, persons, even highly trained, and highly trained mental health professionals who do not have sufficient experience and expertise interacting with and evaluating people with mild intellectual disability often erroneously assume that these pockets of strengths and skills are inconsistent with a diagnosis of intellectual disability ignore findings from a comprehensive individualized evaluation and therefore favor their misconceptions regarding someone with intellectual ability and what they can and cannot do. There's the problem that I have here is that it's blanket and the word and is used frequently. And I'm going to give you another example of, of where um, a concern comes in. Maybe. There it is. Um, shoot, I don't have it. Oh, here it is. Um, Dr. Ollie, who is a fantastic, um, very well-trained ID expert and an expert in um, forensic psychology and the practice, um, opined that not only should an expert doing an Atkins assessment have extensive professional experience working with individuals with intellectual disability, but they should also have extensive experience specifically, specifically with individuals in the mild range. I'm just going to say that oftentimes um, the, these individuals, they don't exist for one thing, and then the people who are going to get knocked out immediately are people who are clinical forensic psychologists, and they're a very good psychologist. And again, not being, not being an attorney, but at this point, at this junction, I feel like the federal rules of evidence that have an or instead of an and in terms of experience, education, and training, I think that fits better. And, and some might say, well, I'm defensive because I am a clinical forensic psychologist, and I don't feel that way. I just feel that if this type of language ever becomes a rule or a standard of practice or law, all of a sudden, we're going to have fewer evaluators and fewer, a lot of competent evaluators will be gone. And so I think in closing, I think 
I, I just want to reiterate, I think this is a fantastic book. I think there needs to be a little bit of discussion about who is appropriate, who, and if there really is a, a perfect expert. So I appreciate being here. I'm, I'm honored to, be, to have been asked. So I'm quite happy here to, to be here to celebrate this book. Uh, I've worked with John on many capital cases and by now uh, actually many ID cases as well. And the very first intellectual disability case that John and I worked on together was a case uh, that we also worked on uh, with Mark, which was his first intellectual disability, you know, At Atkins intellectual disability case, uh, Ringo Pearson, uh, a case in which um, a very good result uh, occurred. <coughs> Uh, a relatively short sentence for our client uh, because of Mark's testimony. So I'm happy to be here uh, and to talk about the book. It's a great collaboration. I think um, John has the scholarly expertise in the law and Mark has the expertise in uh, intellectual disability and it's, it's a great combination. Both have also worked uh, on cases so they have practical experience as well as the scholarly um, perspectives. Um, I thought when I was first reading this book, who is this book for? Uh, and I thought, uh, well, um, it's for psychologists who, whose expertise is intellectual disability and they um, are going to do new forensic work. It is for um, forensic psychologists who haven't done, had a specialty in intellectual disability and who think I really ought to be able to cover that too. It is for lawyers who are starting out doing death penalty cases, their first death penalty cases, um, or, or their first intellectual disability case, even if they've done death penalty cases uh, for a while. And it might be for lawyers who are doing other kinds of work with people with intellectual disabilities where um, intellectual disability affects other legal determinations, such as voluntariness uh, or uh, juvenile sentencing or competence. Uh, to, um, to stand trial. Um, I, I will say, um, when I read this, I was somewhat surprised. It's a pretty, uh, it's a relatively neutral presentation. Uh, John and I are not known for our neutral presentations, uh, so I attribute that uh, tone maybe to Mark. Uh, but in that way, it's also, it's, um, it's good because it's, I think, useful for people on either side. So you could imagine prosecutors reading this and feeling that they benefited from, from what they had to prove or, or disprove, um, as well as defense lawyers uh, reading this. Um, but I will say, as I thought about this audience, I read this a second time um, in preparation for this, and as I thought about this audience, I realized of that list of people that I gave you, there's probably no one in this audience that falls into that category. Um, and there might be one or two, uh, there might be uh, lawyers who will, uh, students who will do that, but there really aren't, that's not what this audience is. So I, I thought about what is this good for, for someone who's not in those categories of likely to practice either as a lawyer or as a psychologist in Atkins cases. And then I thought about what it was that it was useful to me about it, because of course I actually kind of have the primer of intellectual disability already, as well as the primer of um, of death penalty cases. And I, so I'll, I'll share with you what I thought it was useful for for me and what I think might have some broader appeal than just those, those list of people who, for whom the summaries would be really helpful. So um, I thought this is a great example of thinking about the interface, the uneasy interface of law and psychology. Because there are several points uh, at the book where I think, tell me more. How can this be? Um, what do you have to say about this? And initially I thought of this as a criticism of the book. Tell me more. And I, maybe I am going to be a little critical about it too. But mostly I think that it is a, a reflection of how hard it is to mesh these two disciplines. And I, I'll mention two big things and then I'll mention the thing that I'm most interested in. So um, I think uh, Eric's sort of big question is, well, why intellectual disability among all other uh, mitigating uh, po possible mitigation. Why would we view that as a categorical exception? And, you know, um, 
So we, I don't think anyone's actually given us the definition of intellectual disability yet. So I am going to actually stop a minute and say that, uh, which is that you have to have significantly sub-average intellectual functioning, and that's measured generally by an IQ test. Um, and then you have to have uh, significant deficits in adaptive functioning. So we check um, testing by how people live their lives. And then we have to have onset before uh, the age uh, of 18. Uh, or, or possibly in the developmental period in the, in the newest uh, iteration of that definition. So why is it that that is more mitigating than a major mental illness? And so, uh, as Eric points out, if people don't think it's more mitigating, then there's going to be resistance to applying this rule. And I think um, we don't have an answer to that. And we see another prop, now sort of smaller version of that when we say, well, why does this why does this particular definition actually make sense as a categorical exemption? I tend to think of that from my perspective, which is, why does it matter whether intellectual disability occurs before age 18 or occurs later? If you have someone with traumatic brain injury who has who ends up having the same deficits in intellectual functioning and adaptive functioning, why should we care whether this started before age 18 or whether it did not? And from our dinner conversation uh, with Karen and Mark last night, um, the answer to that really has to do with its beginnings uh, in psychology, sort of both understanding uh, what the disability was and also thinking about treatment options for that disability. So um, initially, people, if I understood Mark right, initially people thought about intellectual disability, then called mental retardation, as something that happened in the womb uh, either genetically or something that happened uh, because of something that happened in the womb. And therefore, we looked, we'd have to find evidence of that in the developmental period or we wouldn't have thought that it happened at that time. But that's a very old idea and no longer is there an understanding of etiology as describing or at least as being a necessary part of intellectual disability. So um, why should we care about, why should we care, lawyers care, about onset? And I can't think of any reason that we should care about onset. And my conversation last night did not make me think that there was any reason that I just had failed to think about. So um, that's from sort of my side. It ought to be bigger. I, and I think Eric would say bigger yet. Um, but, but I think also if we were thinking about this from the prosecution side, if you think about, well, why is it that this exact definition is the definition that describes a categorical exemption? So. Why is Bresenio, which is a horrible decision and makes up all kinds of things about what intellectual disability is, well, it doesn't match with, with the uh, professional definition, but why is the professional definition supposed to be the same one that lawyers adopt or the same one that the Supreme Court adopts? And I think there's no answer to that. What we see, though, in the book is sort of repeated places where uh, the authors sort of take on, no, this, def this deviation is wrong, no, this deviation is wrong, no, this deviation is wrong. And while I agree with those things, I think it's an interesting to think, I think about, well, why should we have this match? What, what does the match really mean? And is that really just because it's something specific? So then the other thing that, that's sort of my larger and sort of enduring focus is thinking about how race plays into most criminal procedure decisions. And when I look at this book, and when I think about intellectual disability and race and ethnicity, I see a lot of other examples of a mismatch between the psychologist and the lawyer. So if we ask a psychologist about prong one, measuring of IQ scores, their answer is very clear. So we should pay no attention to uh, race or ethnicity at all in measuring uh, IQ, uh, because there's no scientific basis for thinking that, um, that the tests are biased. So ignore all of that, just use someone's IQ score. And then they will say, well, the com one complication, uh, that'd be true with black defendants, that'd be true with Latino defendants, anybody else. And um, in fact, that was an issue in the very first case that we talked about. Um, the psychologist for the state said, uh, an African-American with an IQ below um, the, the IQ cutoff says, um, no. Um, we don't count him the same way. And the answer to that is, that's wrong. And it's just wrong. Uh, and I think if we look at adaptive functioning, we also have a pretty clear standard from, um, from the psychologists. Uh, you have to count what's culturally relative. 
relevant. So you have to consider a social cultural relativity um, and in judging adaptive functioning. But if you look at lawyers, the, both of these things create huge fights. Um, and sometimes people have that fight because they resist the idea that um, IQ scores are, are neutral, even when it's helpful to their clients. Uh, and sometimes uh, people say uh, about adaptive functioning, well, what exactly does a culturally relevant mean? And we have seen examples that are horrific examples, uh, both on IQ scores of sort of adding scores, uh, depending on the defendant's group, and on, on um, adaptive functioning of saying, no, this, is, this guy is not, uh, has, doesn't have adaptive functioning he's deficits, he's just a Mexican. And there really are atrocious examples of that, and why does that happen when psychologists think this is so easy? And that partly happens because of the adversarialness of the process, uh, and it partly happens because the law hasn't quite solved whether we are going to be colorblind, whether we are going to try to take it into account. And the, the good faith of psychologists in thinking, oh, well, everyone's just going to do this in the way that's accurate is something that we, uh, I think, cannot find uh, with, with lawyers. So we have a mismatch there, and we have a mismatch that the Supreme Court has declined to solve. Um, it has been faced with a number of deviations on both uh, intellectual functioning and adaptive functionings that are grossly wrong, grossly um, discounting the performance of defendants of color. Um, and the Supreme Court has deliberately not taken those cases. If you actually look at the, the case that they did take uh, that sort of slapped down Texas, uh, it is a, a case without an ethnic is issue in it, despite the fact that if you looked at the worst cases Briseño, Lizcano, Maldonado, Hernandez Llanos, all of the worst cases are Latino defendants where either on uh, the intellectual functioning prong or the adaptive functioning prong, uh, there have been gross misuses of race. The Supreme Court has declined uh, to address those. Uh, we might hope that that will change uh, in the future. Uh, so I would have liked to see them talk about some of that, uh, but it did occur to me when I um, when I said that, uh, well, maybe that's really uh, not a primer. The, the subtitle does say it's current issues and, and controversies. And so um, maybe that does mean that uh, they should have addressed it. And maybe that means uh, that's the next book uh, to which I'll look forward. All right, I promise this will not be a boxing match. We're not here um, to rebut, but I, um, I first want to thank uh, Cornell Law School for hosting this book celebration. This is very exciting, very informative to hear um, the comments from these esteemed colleagues who've taken time to read our book. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for coming. Um, I know that although for us uh, the title and the content is riveting, I think there's a commonality among all university students and faculty. Uh, free lunch is a universal uh, incentive. I do want to thank Eric Friedman, uh, Karen Salikin, and Sherry Johnson for taking the time to read our book and provide a very insightful uh, analysis and uh, their remarks, which um, I know we will uh, ponder and, and hopefully discuss over wine and beer uh, at another time. I also want to thank Sandra Babcock for um, serving as a moderator, keeping us all in check, and, and making sure that things go smoothly. Um, I just want to say a few words. So back in July of 2014 was when the acquisition editor of Prager Press sent an email. And the title of the email was, Invitation to Write a Book Important to Public Health. I ignored that email for about a week, <laughs> thinking it was another one of those mass emails you get, you know, inviting you to publish in, in a new journal or a book. And then eventually I got around to reading the email, and I read it, and it was a book on Atkins, Death Penalty and ID. And, and I go, first of all, what does that have to do with public health? But um, I immediately thought that um, there was no way I was going to write this book alone. Um, and the first person, and I don't say this to flatter John Bloom, but the first person I thought of was John. And um, I emailed um, Prager Press and I said, well, if I do this, I would only accept to do this if I can have a co-author who'd have to be um, 
um, I didn't say John then, but I, I said, uh, I'll be back. And of course, they, uh, I reached out to John Bloom and uh, he, his response was um, enthusiastic. But I remember him saying to me on the phone, you realize after writing this book with me, um, you'll never be able to do an Atkins claim again. I, I didn't remember if the emphasis was on this book or with me. Uh, <laughs> um, but that was, um, that was interesting. So then uh, um, a few months later, we got a couple of emails from Prager Press, and I don't know why they were thinking that sending an email in July would get an immediate response from a couple of professors uh, during the summer, but uh, we did get our, our proposal accepted. Um, and um, that was sometime in November 2014. And then we had a, a publication date set for June 2016. We had a couple of minor delays. Um, and I, I think I did have to talk John down a couple of times when our, our editor was um, less than uh, patient with us. But the most important delay came uh, when the Supreme Court of the United States decided to hear um, the Moore, uh, the Texas versus Moore case, which at which point, which um, that came in June of 2016. And so immediately John um, said, well, we definitely have to wait to hear the opinion or the decision from the Supreme Court. And so that got heard in November 2016 and the Supreme Court um, um, released its decision in March of 2017, which we integrated and uh, Fortunately, it was a great decision when you think of some of the crazy stuff going on in Texas around the Brasenio factors. And uh, it's amazing to see, although the, the justices, and I'm uh, like Karen, I'm not going to go too far afoot on, on the legal stuff, but it was interesting to see, although the justices were split on the decision, all, all of them agreed that Brasenio was just a crazy idea, which, which I think in of itself was amazing. Um, so. I, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist, but have always worked and done my research in intellectual disability. So Karen and I are kind of these dueling experts where I'm sure she curses me out uh, and I curse her out. Um, not her personally, but um, forensic psychologists versus ID experts, because it's true, ID experts were not trained um, in um, the, um, the rules of um, of, of law and presentation and, and you know how to be an effective uh, expert in the courtroom. And so sometimes um, we may not make the best experts. And, and the criticism I have, which I, I lay out a little bit in the book of forensic experts is sometimes they're out on the outer edge of their knowledge. And, 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 and this is exclusion, uh, Karen Salikin, but uh, many of these forensic experts know very little about intellectual disability. And the Ringo Pearson case, which was the first one to draw me into Atkins was a good example of how some of these psychologists say the stupidest things, but with full assurance because they are a licensed psychologist. So I want to thank you. I want to thank John Bloom. Um, John Bloom made this book really stronger and better. Uh, he challenged me um, and pushed me to go to places where I did not want to go uh, <laughs> and talk about things that I thought I didn't have to talk about, but really uh, emphasizing it. So I think if this book is really uh, a good primer, I think it's because um, of this collaboration uh, bringing us down and, and reminding me that we need to explain why in the DSM-5, the statement of adaptive behavior deficits must be related to intellectual disability deficits is a, a statement that needs to be explained. Uh, why we need to explain why the facts of the crime are not relevant in the diagnosis of intellectual disability or why clinical judgment is important. So all these elements, I think, um, were really um, impressed upon me in my collaboration with John. So, you know, like um, I, I take away from the comments of uh, these three esteemed colleagues is really after it, and this is me, um, after any research study that we've done at the end of three, four, five years, we start analyzing the data, we start looking at the results, we start batting back and forth the implications. We immediately realize that we should have done this differently, we should have done that, we should have measured this. So yeah, I think I walk away um, realizing that there's more for us to do. Probably not in a second edition just yet, maybe a couple of peer-reviewed papers to um, fill in some of the blanks and respond to some of these things. But again, um, 
I want to thank you for coming, and I hope our book um, is of some use to you in your work um, if you choose to work in this area. Thank you. So uh, one thing I realized is Mark and I might have the greatest height differential of co-authors in history. Uh, you know, in this. So I do want to thank uh, everyone uh, for coming. Uh, and before I respond to the comments, a few particularly thanks to the law school, obviously, for hosting this, uh, and thanks, as Mark said, to, to all of you for coming and for. Uh, you know, Prager Press did approach Mark about this book. They didn't approach me, uh, and Mark did ask me, and I'm very glad uh, that he did. Uh, and so, you know, I also want to thank Sandra and Eric and Karen and Sherry uh, for taking the time to sort of participate uh, in this event. And again, you know, you uh, for coming. Uh, I want to also thank, and I'm going to try and do this, uh, I think another group of people that I'd like to thank is the clients that I've had uh, over the years uh, who have had intellectual disability. Uh, and what I've sort of learned from them uh, about what intellectual disability is or isn't. Uh, and so, but I do want to do one sort of thing to, uh, to really go back to the origins, because I think if there's one person uh, that changed sort of where I am and, and really ultimately led to my participation uh, in this project, uh, it would be this guy. Uh, so uh, this is a man by the name of Lemmy Arthur. Uh, and I met him in 1987. Yes, for those of you who can see, that's actually me uh, in there. And this was before many of the students in here were even born. Uh, and what happened is I was on death row one day back when we could walk on the row. Uh, and, a, and another client of mine on death row pulled me to the side uh, and said, you need to help Lemmy Arthur. Uh, there's something really messed up about him. Uh, and so I walked over to Mr. Arthur's cell. Uh, and I began to talk with him, uh, and it was very clear to me very quickly that there, they were right. There was something not right uh, about him. And so uh, I agreed to sort of represent him and take his case on. I didn't know anything about mental retardation or intellectual disability, so I started reading, uh, and I contacted people then who were the leading experts in the area, not in the death penalty. They didn't really do anything with the death penalty, but were people named Jim Ellis and Ruth Luckison. Uh, and so we ended up having a hearing in 1987 on whether someone uh, with intellectual disability could be sentenced to death. Uh, and, of course, we lost. Arthur Lemmy did get off the row uh, eventually. And in 2002, the court uh, decided Atkins. Uh, and so uh, the rest of this is sort of, you know, history uh, in that regard. But I think, uh, you know, really it was my interaction. It was really just a random act of a death row inmate saying, go talk to this guy. Uh, that really created my interest uh, in this topic. Uh, so let me respond to a couple things that people said, and then we can turn it over, uh, you know, for questions uh, in this. Uh, there was some talk about, there's been a lot of people have mentioned Bresenio, so many of you don't know what Bresenio is, but I think it sort of ties into Eric's question. What happened right after the Atkins decision was decided, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, in a case called Bresenio, uh, basically just kind of said outright, we don't really agree with the Atkins decision. Uh, you know, and we don't really think that everyone who falls into the diagnostic criteria of intellectual disability should be exempt from execution. We think only the people who your average Texan would think was sufficiently not morally culpable. Uh, so, and they said, for example, we can all agree that Lenny of Steinbeck's Mice and Men shouldn't be executed. Uh, but that doesn't mean that everyone should. So they then went out of their way to create these additional factors which courts should consider, uh, which I won't go into in detail, but they deviated significantly from clinical consensus. But that then raises sort of the question that Eric sort of lied into, because what makes Atkins different, right, is intellectual disability is not a legal construct. Uh, it's a psychological diagnosis. And so the Atkins bar is really the only thing in the law where someone can be exempt, right? It's not insanity, that's a legal construct, not a psychiatric, it's not competency, but it's purely diagnostic. Uh, and so because of that, since Atkins, there's been this continued battle back and forth between states uh, that want to do sort of more or less what Eric said, gauge moral culpability more to the nexus between the disability and the offense, uh, and, also, and then the pushback that going, you know, no, there is no nexus requirement. This is really about whether someone falls in 
to the diagnostic criteria. And the Supreme Court of the United States uh, has had, you know, to continually sort of deal with this battle uh, of where states deviate from what a psychologist would understand intellectual disability to be uh, and what a state would be. Uh, and so, you know, as this continues to go on, maybe that will be fodder for another book. I think, from my perspective, one of the interesting things about writing this book uh, is uh, that really, uh, and it's, you know, I wrote it with a psychologist, but one of the funny things about it is the sections that I wrote about the law are really written for the psychologist. And the part that Mark wrote about the psychology are really written for the lawyers. Uh, so, you know, that was an unusual project in that regard. Uh, and so, you know, I, I want to thank some of the people that were here. Uh, Dr. Susan Knight, for example, who teaches with us, who I had to sort of, you know, say, can you, can you understand this? Uh, can I, have I written this in a way which is sort of accessible uh, to people that, that aren't trained, uh, you know, in the law? Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that part of it was good and hopefully uh, you know, it was the other th another thing about this is Mark and I agreed ahead of time that we were going to keep this short uh, and that we were going to come in under 200 pages on this because this isn't intended to be the war and peace of intellectual disability and capital punishment. Uh, you know, it's intended to sort of explain this to people in sort of a concise way. If they want more, they can go get more. And so I do have to thank Mark on this because I think on every chapter I would go, we should say more about this. We should say more about this. We should say more about that. Uh, and he was very good at going no. Uh, you know, no, we're, we're not going to do that. Uh, the one place, though, where I think we should have done more, uh, I, and maybe we will do this more later, uh, and I, I think Sherry put her finger on this, is I don't think we did enough uh, on the issue of race and ethnicity. Uh, and uh, I don't, uh, you know, we had a number of discussions about that, about whether we should do more, because it really is truthfully uh, shameful uh, for how people, uh, especially uh, per Hispanics uh, who were charged with these crimes, how they're really treated and how their cases uh, are adjudicated. And I think Karen or Eric mentioned, well, one of the things that's useful about this book is the empirical part of it, uh, and I'm glad that he, they said that. But you don't really need to know much empiricism. If the person has a Hispanic surname, you, if they're going to lose. Uh, and that is sort of just the cold, hard truth. Uh, what has sort of happened in the post Atkins world. Uh, so, uh, with that, I will stop. If people have questions, we have a few minutes left. Uh, and thank you again for coming.